Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about, or at least talk to, the question, should you buy a property without having a loan pre-approval in place? And what's the pros and cons of doing so? What are the risks and so forth? So at the moment, uh, many lenders are taking many weeks, uh, sometimes months to approve loans. Uh, And mainly it's caused by, you know, higher loan volumes, which has been uh, well documented lately. Uh, But also uh, because of lockdowns in uh, India and the Philippines, uh, the banks have had to onshore their back office services. So previously, a lot of work was done in those locations offshore, um, but because of COVID, they can't do that. Uh, And uh, obviously, there's some operational disruption as a result of that. Uh, So... As a result, the banks are prioritising applications uh, for purchases first. So, you know, if a client is actually, a borrower has actually purchased a property, uh, then they have a definitive settlement date to meet. They will prioritise those first, uh, then refinances, and then last comes pre-approvals. Uh, so as you can imagine, pre-approvals drop to the bottom of the list, uh, and sometimes it can take a long time in order to get a pre-approval. And in a very buoyant market like we're in today, that can create issues because, you know, the right property might crop up. All of a sudden, we've got a client on the phone saying, well, I want to bid at auction, but I don't have time to get a pre-approval. What do I do? Hence the topic for this blog. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about what is a pre-approval. Essentially, it's a uh, conditional loan approval. And typically, the predominant condition is that the borrower is able to offer a suitable property as security for a loan. So for example, a bank might approve a loan for, say, $800,000, subject to the borrower providing an acceptable property as security uh, of at least a million dollars and that that property has to value in at a million dollars from the bank valuer. And that's obviously to keep the loan to value ratio at 80%. Uh, Of course, you can borrow more than that, and it just depends on the situation. But it really gives a lender the opportunity to really look at all your information and say, yes, if you go out and buy something for a million bucks, we're happy to lend you $800,000. Sometimes can be called an approvable approval in principle as well. Of course, arranging a pre-approval gives... Uh, property purchases some level of security and certainty uh, and also your mortgage broker some certainty that um, it's okay to go out and buy. But as I discussed a little bit later on, not all pre-approvals are the same. Uh, They don't cost anything, uh, so there's no fees associated with getting a pre-approval and you're certainly not obligated to use that bank or borrow that loan amount either. So um, it gives you some flexibility there. If you have a pre-approval in place, However, sometimes things can still go wrong. So it's not a case of reducing every single risk. There are still some risks that people need to be aware of. And probably the only material risk is a low bank valuation. Uh, So banks will typically lend against the contract of sale price or the valuation, whichever is the lower. So it's quite possible that if you go and pay a million dollars for a property uh, and it values in at 950 then the bank's only going to lend against 950. And if you want to keep the loan to value ratio at 80%, instead of being able to borrow 800, you'll be able to borrow 760, which means you need to put another $40,000 of cash or additional security into that uh, property or into that loan uh, in order to be able to settle on it. Um, the other risk is a change in circumstances. Uh, So if you get a pre-approval and then subsequently lose your job, for example, of course that's going to change the pre-approval. So if the change in circumstances occurs before you purchase, well, that's pretty simple. You just go back to your lender or mortgage broker and and inquire or confirm whether that's going to have an impact on uh, your pre-approval. If your circumstances change between when you actually buy uh, and when you get the loan formally approved or unconditionally approved, it's called, Um, That could potentially uh, cause problems, although um, it's a pretty narrow risk. Um, So uh, normally if you go and purchase, uh, you'll probably have an unconditional approval somewhere within one to say 10 days. Um, And so I've never had a situation that I can recall uh, where a client has lost their job or had a major change in circumstances 
um, uh, between those two periods. So valuation risk is probably uh, the most uh, material one or most common one. Um, now, how common are low valuations? Well, they're not very that. They're not very common. Of course, um, it, when a property sells in an open market situation, so if you go and buy a property at an auction, for example, uh, well, uh, and if that's a standard sort of open market sale, well, that's pretty strong evidence of current market value. Of course, the definition of current market value is what a property will uh, transact for between a knowledgeable and willing buyer and a knowledge and will, willing seller. So um, it's very difficult then, I guess, for a value to argue that is not uh, fair market value. Uh, but that might occur in some situations where there just isn't enough evidence of comparable sales of comparable properties to su support the purchase price. And that's when you'll get a low valuation. So it's either very unique property, buying an area where there's very low transactional volume or where the market has, has certainly moved, um, but the comparable sales don't really support that, that market, market moving a, a bit higher. It is possible to challenge them. If you get a low bank valuation, it certainly is possible to challenge it, uh, although for a variety of reasons, mostly ego, um, uh, most valuers aren't going to change it unless you can present new evidence. So if there's comparable sales of properties that um, that have completed, so they don't have, they can't be on market, um, they've got to have completed um, it, that they haven't taken into account in their valuation, then you've probably got a good chance to change it. But if you have no evidence and all you're doing is disagreeing with the, their subjective assessment of value. Um, well, you, you, you're not. You're very unlikely going to change the valuation. And in that situation, typically the most expedient solution is to go to a different bank. Uh, and of course, you've got to pick a bank that uses a different valuation firm in that location, because um, otherwise you're just going to get the same valuer again, uh, and they're going to see on their system that they've already valued that property. Uh, so it would maybe happen uh, two or three times a year in our business that we'd come across this situation. Um, it isn't always reflective of the vendor or the purchaser, I should say, overpaying. It can, at times, be a reflection of just a poor quality valuation, that the valuer just doesn't have enough experience or is a, is a bit silly at the time um, and hasn't, ha haven't done their due diligence. So typically it's an easy one to solve, but you've typically got to go to a different bank. Of course, if you have actually overpaid for a property, you know, you've paid a lot more than all the comparable sales, then the chances of getting a valuation at contract price are probably pretty low. Now, one of the biggest benefits of um, getting a pre-approval is that you find out about things uh, that you might not already know about. Uh, so the, unknowns, the, the unknown stuff is the stuff that's really going to trip you up or cause problems uh, when getting a loan approved. Uh, so sometimes um, potential borrowers sit back and look at their financial situation and draw their own conclusions based on logic. They might say, look, I've got a couple of million dollars in the bank. I only want to borrow half a million dollars. I'm going to buy this property and it's going to be positive cash flow because my gearing is low. So logic tells me that any bank's going to be happy with that. Um, this is a flawed approach because sometimes, or maybe I should say often, uh, bank credit policies often lack logic. So just because you think you're a low-risk proposition doesn't mean the bank will agree with you. A and we can argue to a blue in the face about what is reasonable and rational and logical and all those sorts of things, um, but really we're going to play the bank's game uh, and, and work out you know, who's going to approve the loan, who's the best lender, how to pitch it, all those sorts of things. Banks use comprehensive credit scoring models in order to assess a, an applicant's uh, credit worthiness. So uh, there's lots of different things that go into that, the amount of time you've been in your home, the amount of time you've been in a job, uh, that your, your credit score um, on your credit file, lots of different things. So a lot of things that most lay people, you know, people that don't really have a good understanding of uh, credit approval processes might think are inconsequential. So what I'm trying to say there is that you might look at your financial position and there might be some things that you think are inconsequential but actually will make a big difference to the bank. And so by getting a pre-approval, at least uncovers whether any of those things exist. Now, a good mortgage broker will be able to find or identify a lot of those, uh, but still there might be things on 
you know, your credit file, for example, you might there might be a, a bill that you were never aware of that was never paid um, and uh, um, uh, appears as a default. Or your credit file could contain errors. These are the sorts of things you want to find out now um, rather than after the fact uh, if they're going to cause you uh, stress and problems. Normally there's a solution, by the way, to all these things, but um, they, it just uh, uh, causes undue stress, unnecessary stress. So how good are pre-approvals and how much do they reduce their re- reduce your risk? Well, um, it depends on what type of pre-approval. So there's kind of two types, if you like. The first one um, goes through the same credit approval process as a full application. So that means that uh, a, a human credit assessor picks up your file, verifies the information, uh, runs it through the system, uh, considers all the, the pros and cons and everything that's on their checklist and credit policy and says yes or no. The second type is where it just goes through the bank system, but no one verifies the data. No human looks at the data. So, of course, um, it, it's only as good as the amount of data that's put into the system uh, and, and the question about whether the bank agrees with that assessment of that data, you know, is that really the income we're going to use uh, in our credit assessment? Uh, well, that, that, um, that sort of uh, assessment doesn't occur because it doesn't, um, it's not seen by a human being. So, of course, if there's any ambu- ambiguity or subjectivity to the data or to a borrower's situation, you really need that first pre-approval. You need it to go to credit. Uh, you need a credit manager to look at it uh, and give you the the comfort that it's all okay. A system approved uh, pre-approval um, is useful in some circumstances, but but not in others. It really just depends on uh, the borrower's situation. Is it risky to buy a property without pre-approval? Which is really the 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 guts of the 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 topic today. And I guess there's really two considerations that. Um, we would we would contemplate or, or take into account uh, when making this analysis. The first one is how much are you wanting to borrow uh, compared to your total or your maximum borrowing capacity? So for example, if I had a client that um, had heaps of borrowing capacity, two or $3 million, and in this scenario, they only wanted to borrow half a million dollars, well, then there's plenty of upside. Even a small change or difference in you know, the lender taking a, a lower amount of income for, you know, a, a potential rental property or, you know, employment income or those sorts of things. Even if we're a little bit incorrect in those things or we've got different views and opinions, uh, it's not going to matter. We're going to get that loan approved. We're not looking to borrow to our maximum. Uh, whereas if I've got a client that is looking to borrow their max, if their maximum borrowing capacity is a million and we want 950, uh, well, then there is no real margin for error. And when I say error, it's not an error per se. It's uh, a difference in opinion or difference in credit policy about what a credit assessor might take into account. They might shade income further. Uh, they might take a lower amount. They might um, do, do those sorts of things. It, it is a, su- a subjective process. The second assessment is really one that's based on you know almost 20 years of experience in um, since, since founding ProSolution. It's really um, asking ourselves, are we going to get this loan approved? You know, is there a lender out there that's going to be happy to do this loan? Um, and I'm not talking about any lender, obviously a lender that's going to be competitive in terms of interest rates and fees. If a client situation is relatively clear cut, um, we've considered all the risks, um, we've considered you know, what don't we know and what do we know today, all those sorts of things, and we can draw a conclusion that we have a very high level of confidence that we'd get a loan approved, uh, well then in that situation uh, we would be suggesting to the client that a pre-approval is still good if we can get one but not absolutely necessary. However, if there's a lot of subjectivity, if there's a lot of uncertainty, um, if it's not clear cut, uh, they're the sorts of things that we might look at it and go, look, we think we can, but we'd much rather uh, get a pre-approval. There are some situations where we might think, well, um, we're very confident that um, one of the, or multiple uh, of the uh, 30 plus lenders on our panel that will approve the loan, but whether your your um, uh, preferred lender, say if it was ANZ, for example, whether ANZ will approve the loan, look, we've got an 80% certainty. Uh, whether a lender other than ANZ will approve a loan, we've got a 99% certainty. 
So in that situation, we would invite the client just to make friends with kind of what we would consider is the worst, the most reasonable worst case scenario is that we'd have to use a lender other than their preferred lender. And the mortgage market is so competitive, we're not really talking about a big difference uh, in most circumstances between you know rates and fees. So it's not like we're paying a higher amount, it's more just about preferences. But that's the thing, a mortgage broker can make that assessment because they have a broad panel of lenders um, and they can give you a, a, an indication, is this going to work or is it not going to work? Whereas if you're just willing, dealing with one bank, you're dealing with one set of credit policies, um, one process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need to really think carefully about how experienced the bank or mortgage broker is in advising you. Because uh, I've seen some horrible cases of people getting some advice from either mortgage broker and typically, or more often I should say, um, some branch staff where they've said, oh no, it's all good, you can, you can borrow this much and the person has acted on it and the person didn't have any clue. Uh, so you've really got to, if you're going to trust the indications of a credit advisor or a banker, I'd invite you to really think carefully about the level of that person's experience and how comfortable you are about whether they know what they're talking about. Don't just trust the brand. You know, if you're dealing with a big four bank, for example, you think, oh, well, NAB can't get it wrong. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, and it's really what you're doing is trusting that individual that you're sitting in front of uh, and whether that's a, a, the right thing to do. So let's assume you've got your pre-approval. Look, you think you've mitigated most risks. Um, the common question we get, can you minimise or mitigate the valuation risk? And can you get the bank to value a property before you go and purchase it? Well, no, not anymore. Banks won't value properties uh, in t unless your name is on that on the title of that property. They don't want to be seen to making or influencing the market. They don't want to um, go and value property at a million dollars and then influence you to only pay a million dollars. Then they're really making the market. Uh, they will only value the property after the fact. Now, of course, you could go and engage the same firm that the bank uses uh, and pay for your own valuation and ask them to prepare it for mortgage purposes. Um, and that will give you some level of comfort. Look, whether the valuation firm's going to be conservative in that situation to mitigate their own risks uh, is a question you'd need to contemplate. Um, for the most part, most people wouldn't do that. And maybe you'd only do that in very rare circumstances where the property that you're looking at is very unique and you're very sensitive uh, to any valuation shortfalls that might occur. Undertaking your own comparable research, however, is probably uh, the best thing that you can do. I mean, it's something you should be doing anyway when contemplating uh, spending a lot of money on a property. Um, but probably better yet again is to engage the services of a very experienced and trustworthy buyer's agent. So you need someone that's a local area expert um, and they will have a lot of up-to-date experience and knowledge about what a property will be worth. They will undertake comparable sales research on your behalf and because it's so subjective, um, it's often good to get someone that's a, a third party to do that rather than yourself. And that's probably the best way to kind of mitigate um, overpaying uh, for a property and therefore um, mitigate the chances of a evaluation coming under contract price. So just as a wrap up, buying property without pre-approval is not without risk, of course. Um, sometimes the risk is acceptable in some situations. Uh, you know, if you've got a very strong borrowing capacity, if you've got a, a really good experienced mortgage broker and they're very comfortable, um, and that's why having a really experienced team uh, that might include a, a financial planner, a mortgage broker, a buyer's agent around you helps you kind of win at the game of investing. I think this um, podcast goes some way to demonstrating that really investing is a game of finance rather than a game of assets, say property and shares. Um, that said, if you do go and buy a property without a pre-approval, remember it's your risk. It's your risk that you're taking. It's your money. It's the, the deposit you pay um, at the end of the day is at risk if you can't settle on it. So always proceed with caution. That's it for me for this week. Uh, before I let you go, um, just a reminder, if you really do enjoy the podcast, please leave a rating wherever you listen uh, and share it with any family and friends. That would be greatly appreciated. Until next week, bye for now.